By now, you've heard about Global Poker, one of the fastest growing online card rooms available in the US and Canada today. So what's stopping you from trying it out? Global Poker is a safe and secure social poker site that uses their own patented sweepstakes model. Signing up is easy. You can use Google, Facebook, or just an email address. You can always play for free on Global Poker, but you can also buy gold coins for additional play, which will earn sweeps coins that can be redeemed for real cash to a bank account, Skrill account, or even as a gift card. Get a free 5,000 gold coins when you sign up right now at GlobalPoker.com. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales, both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. This is episode number 130, featuring Miami John Cernudo. Uh, John is, uh, of course, a legend in the poker world, having played professionally for the last four decades. He has the distinction of being the Iron Man of the live tournament circuit, holding the record for the most caches in poker history. His current count sits at just over 540 caches, and there's a sizable gap between himself and the rest of the field. To put this into perspective, John is currently beating Phil Helmuth by almost 200 caches. Of those caches, more than 60 of them are wins. And in addition to holding the cash record, John also has three World Series of Poker bracelets, winning the 1996 Stud High Low event, the 1997 No Limit Hold'em event, and the 2002 Limit Omaha event. John is now 78 years old, but he's still going strong with tournaments and in fact just recorded a couple final table finishes in the last week here in Las Vegas. Recently, John shared his years of experience with card player columnist Dr. Alan Schoonmaker for the book Make Better Poker Tournament Deals. This poker manual, which is now available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and wherever you get your books, teaches you how to get the most out of your opponents when someone brings up a chop. And as John says, the book will more than pay for itself after your very first deal. This was a very interesting interview, and I got to ask John about all sorts of stuff, including his former career as an air traffic controller, uh, playing 500, 1,000 stakes with a Prince of Arabia, and which player he thinks has the best shot at breaking his cash record. Enough intro. Here is my conversation with Miami John Cernudo. I'm here with the one and only Miami John Cernudo. Miami John. Wow, in the flesh. How you doing? I'm, I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, you know, I mentioned in the flesh because we're doing this podcast in person. It's been a while since I've done one of these in person. You know, the pandemic kind of ruined that tradition for a little while, but I'm glad to be getting back to it. So thanks for being the first. Well, you're quite welcome. And the pandemic was pretty brutal for everybody. Yeah. I spent like a year and a half in my condo with my daughter. <laughs> You're cooped up, huh? I was cooped up. Cooped but, up with uh, nowhere to go. Yeah, yeah. We uh, did home games on uh, Poker Stars. So we did spend the time with a group of us like Linda Johnson and Jan Fisher and Jeannie David. We, we had fun and uh, it did help pass the time away. Yeah, for sure. You got to keep it, keep the, the wheels turning, right? Uh, yes. I We did a little uh, Poker Stars home game ourselves uh, during the pandemic just to stay sane um let's talk a little bit about you and your amazing career um in the poker world but first before poker mm. let's get back to jersey city right That's why aren't my... you jersey city john <laughs> well um no particular reason because i moved to miami when i was 11 years old so i, I kind of grew up there and when I came out to Vegas, I had just left Miami. I think I was about 38 years old. And uh, so the reason why I came to Miami, John, was um, it was kind of funny. I was at the Stardust playing uh, a 10-20 game. And this girl I had met the night before, a couple nights ago, 
paged me and she didn't know my name and she <laughs> said uh so over the back in those days where you didn't have cell phones the uh they would page you, you know, you have a phone call or something like that. And they said, phone call for Miami, ba Miami baby doll John. And I said, <laughs> who the heck is that? You know, but I had to answer, it must be me, you know. Yeah. So I kind of liked the name. And uh, there were a lot of nicknames out at the time, like Amarillo. And I said, let me try that, you know. So I, I entered my, I hadn't won a major tournament. So I said, I'm going to enter as Miami John Sanudo. So I kind of bestowed it upon myself, I guess, or she did. <laughs> yeah. And I won that tournament wire to wire. I'll never forget it. You know, it's just everything really, really went my way. You know, if I was, it was a stud tournament. So if I had an ace up, I never had aces. But by the seventh card, I'd always have aces full or aces up. And it's just <laughs> a miracle. You got to keep the name after that, right? Yeah. So I figured yeah, I was pretty lucky. So I kind of kept it. Well, I'm wearing my best Miami shirt in, I see honor, that. in honor of this interview. The right colors, Miami I, Vice. <laughs> well, it's actually a Miami Heat shirt. Uh, I am from Miami originally. Oh, I didn't know that. So, uh, you know, I have a lot of Heat gear. I always see you around the tables in Dolphins gear, so. Yes, yes, I'm a big Miami Dolphin fan, there you for go. sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, let's, before we get to Miami, we got to talk Jersey. So what are your parents doing at this time? Uh, both parents are deceased. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, at the time you were in Jersey City. Oh, okay. Um, my mom was a secretary and, uh, my father had, uh, worked and on the docks. He was, uh, kind of a mechanic and he had an army buddy that moved to Florida and said he hated the shoveling of the snow in Jersey City. So in about 1955, he's packed up, uh, the family, the furniture, bought a truck, put everything in the truck and moved kit and caboodle down the hot place called Hialeah, Florida, which is right outside of Miami. That's where I was raised. Wow. Hialeah. Me, kind of me too, actually. Hialeah was a little different when I was there than you were, I'm sure, but yeah. Yeah, well, they had the racetrack there, and yeah. uh, you know, I, I wasn't a gambler at age 11, but I could hear the call of the races mm -hmm. from my bedroom window every race, you know. I was wondering, well, that sounds exciting, but I wonder what they do down there. Now it's a casino, I heard. That's right. Yeah, the Hialeah Casino. I stopped there one day about five years ago, and uh, I visited the track. It was very nostalgic for me, and uh, saw the clubhouse where I used to place my bets, and and uh, the track was uh, the Fl I think the flamingos were still there. I'm not sure. I I can't remember, but the they would have them in the center, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. So the but the track was all you know not kept. It had weeds and everything in it. Yeah, yeah. Now there's no more. Now it's not even dog tracks down there anymore. They, uh, they made right. that illegal, so yeah. Most of them became poker rooms. Exactly. Okay, so yeah, so you were, you're in Miami, and were you playing cards all your life? Only family games, you know, like my mother had a woman's club, and they would meet every Wednesday night, and they would play two cents, three cents poker, and uh, the family, my aunts and my uncles, my grandmother, all played poker, but it was all, you know, deuces wild, seven card stud, you know. Yeah. Nothing like what you have today, but it was fun, and and uh, you know my grandmother and my aunt, if they if uh, I lost my money, they'd throw me lucky quarters, you know, say here Johnny, you know, but it it was a lot of fun, you know, and another thing you learned at that age, it uh, uh, you don't check raise, you know, because we didn't know what that was back then, but when I brought my check raising skills back to the family games my mother would say you don't check raise your mother i said okay that's right you're right <laughs> people forget it used to be considered really rude yes to do it. like yeah. in some card rooms even disallowed it back in the day like when they first opened yeah there's like uh some old timey signs you could find out on google that said a check and a raise is not allowed <laughs> We, you know, we were playing gentlemen's poker back then. I guess, yeah, right? exactly. Uh, all right, so I believe they called it cutthroat back then. Cutthroat. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, what was the plan growing up in Miami? What did you want to do? Well, I'd say through high school, I I kind of wanted to become uh, an FBI person. Okay. So I went to college, but I, of course, like everybody else, I changed my major three times, and then <laughs> I majored in business. Got Florida at, State University. That's correct. Uh, Seminole. Home of the Florida State Seminoles. You don't want yeah. to know where I went to school. Oh, University of Florida. Yeah, oh I'm my okay God. <laughs> You and Randy O'Hell. Oh, my God. Randy's a good buddy of mine. That's right. Yeah. It's taken, you know, uh, probably the last decade that I don't hold that grudge anymore. 
but it, it took like 50 years to get rid of that. It's, there was a hatred, you know. House, yeah. There were houses divided in Florida for sure. Yeah. <laughs> the only Seminole that uh, is Randy Holland that I know that also mm-hmm. plays poker, you know. Another guy with a ton of caches. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. We'll talk about him a little later in the podcast. Okay. Um, okay, so you go to Florida State. How does that degree turn into being an air traffic controller? Only that it qualified me to take the test, nothing. It, it didn't help me, you know, but they were hiring at the time, and to be able to take the civil service test, you had to have either aviation or pilot experience or um, a college degree. So that enabled me to take the civil service test, and I passed it and uh, got hired. I even forget the year, 1971, I think it was. What... Uh drew you to that profession my father was in the faa and he told me about it you know and i had a neighbor also that was an air traffic controller when i grew up in hialeah and uh so i knew a little bit about it uh didn't know much about aviation i was uh uh, really green on that kind of stuff but you they have a quite an accredited course it takes uh two or three years before you're actually on your own working the planes without supervision you know, yeah. on the radar scopes. And uh, just before I left on strike, we, were, we had computers do a lot of the work, but most of my years at the FAA were spent on the old radar, which every 13 seconds it would do a sweep and it would update your information. So It'd give you a new dot to look at. A new dot to look at, and uh, they would, you would have a little plastic shield that you would write the name of, like Eastern Airlines, you'd put EA, and then the flight number with 325, and then you would push it with your finger. That's crazy. Yeah, that's how you, that was your tracking That's how you device. kept track, literally pushing them along on a map. <laughs> yeah. I remember one time I came in on the midnight shift, and I, I got briefed. And uh, he said, well, I got two planes, and one's national going west, and the other one's eastern going right. And Or he said national and eastern. Uh, so I looked at the scope of the little plastic shields, and I said, yeah, but there's, they're blank. There's nothing on there. And he goes, oh, yeah. And he switches the blank things around. <laughs> says, this is Eastern, this is National. So, but it was, uh, air traffic control is a much bigger science than that, trust me. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a notoriously stressful job, right? It was yes, it was. The it most was. stressful job in the country at some point. It was. And uh, we thrived on stress. We were like they called stress junkies, you know. And uh, like bring them on you know we we were just enjoyed it you know it's it was part of our dna i guess so the more planes we had the busier we were the more we'd spit out the clearances uh the more we liked it you know it was a challenge we always had help i mean if you got too busy you know they people would plug into the radio with you and they do things for you Uh, they move you know they move the the shield the plastic shields they they'd update the strips um so, you know, we had plenty of help, but it was uh, quite an experience and job every one of us loved. We were probably the best trained workforce that they will ever have because we, um, we could control airplanes without radar. That, yeah. That's how skilled we were or tr- well trained we were. But those are days of the past. They have backup after backup, so they don't really need that anymore. Were and there any particularly they, stressful situations? Um, well... I didn't have any close calls, if that's what you're talking yeah. about, but uh, they have that. <laughs> You'd have to talk somebody down who was, the two pilots were passed out and now a passenger has to fly? <laughs> no, nothing like that. <laughs> and if I had to uh, give somebody instructions, I would call somebody else because yeah. I, I was not a man of the cockpit. I had no idea, you know, yeah. how, to, how to guide anybody in. But um, they have this game called Two Truths and a Lie. I don't know if you ever heard of that one, but my one truth which everybody it fools everybody is that i was an air traffic controller and on one occasion two jets collided and 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 crashed or uh hit hit each other while i was working well everybody thinks that's a lie but it was a truth but there's always a catch to the story and the catch was they were air force jets and they were responsible for their own uh, separation wasn't on your watch yeah no it wasn't a matter of watch it was they have to separate right. themselves because right. they're flying side by side you know uh we would have to keep airplanes five miles apart yeah 
but these guys are on a mission, so they're right next to each other. So they're responsible for their own separation. But still, that's got to look crazy, especially on radar at that. No, point, it comes right? up as one blip. Right. Yeah. 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 It's just one flight. You you just treat it as one flight. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, that job is always portrayed a certain way in TV shows and, and movies. You know? Yes. Sometimes for comedy, movie right. like Airplane. Um, do you like seeing that kind of stuff? Is it you know, or you, does, do they always get it wrong? Or is, uh, is it, does it give you PTSD? <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's a slight exaggeration, I'm sure. You know, that Push and Tin movie was really phenomenally done well, I thought. Um, and quite, quite funny. Uh, I hadn't seen it uh, until maybe four or five years ago, which you would think that, wow, why didn't you see that yeah. series? You know? <laughs> but my friend and actor, James Wood, said, you never seen Push and Tin? He said, it's got the funniest scenes in there, and you, you got to see it. Tell me, if, you know, if it's exactly what it was like. And it was pretty close. Pretty close? Yeah, yeah. There, there were guys that, uh, you know, they had egos, and they, they could do things better than you, or you could do things better than them. So there was always a little kibitzing going on, yeah. but uh, nothing like what the movie was. Yeah, yeah. Safety was always first and foremost of course that's got to be the paramount right there okay so you're in the job for 10 years and uh, 81 rolls around and you guys ask for a little bit more money uh -huh. a little bit shorter work week maybe some better retirement packages yeah, you've done your homework <laughs> i got wikipedia up. <laughs> uh you know obviously there was thirteen thousand of you guys nationwide correct yeah and you all decided to uh, walk off the job. That's correct. What was that like? Well, um, it was quite uh, a lot of craziness, and there was a lot of camaraderie. Uh, none of us liked the FAA, or very few of us do, even the ones that scabbed and went back to work. Uh, I mean, none of us are really fond of the agency. I mean, if they were career orientated to being a supervisor, I guess you were, you know. But uh, so 13,000 of us walked out. Uh, a certain amount went back, and I believe 11,500 of us got fired. And uh, so we, you know, we went on strike. We picketed. We did that. And eight or nine months went by, and, uh, you know, we just, it just kind of faded out. They replaced us. Um, did they do it safely and wisely? Probably not, but the public doesn't really know that all they see see is the news and the headlines but there were some safety issues you were famously that, fired uh, by the president president reagan technically you're fired by the head of the department of transport mm -hmm. transportation i guess so, yeah so uh, but he i guess he took credit for it <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah about only about 10 percent went back um after they basically just said no mm -hmm. and then uh you know the real kick in the pants is that they banned you from ever working for the government again Right? No. At they, least that's what it some says. Friends of my, uh, some friends of mine uh, were banned us from air traffic control work. Some okay. friends of mine went to customs and they, you know, have confessions. And, uh, confessions. <laughs> uh, that's a different podcast. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> now they went to uh, customs and they did, um, they got to their retirement and they retired out, you know, through government service. A lot went postal. I don't mean went postal. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. <laughs> went to the post office. Yeah. <laughs> Some of them felt like going postal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm assuming at this time, especially during the strike, you're playing cards and it's paying the bills? Um, we didn't play professionally. We played home games. Yeah. Uh, we did play at work. We actually had a system where we could keep we didn't put money on the table, but we'd have a break room, and on, on our breaks, we'd play one and two dollar poker. So we would just keep track of the bets on paper, and then we'd keep track of the tallies, and at the end of the pay cycle, we'd pay up. Yeah. So uh, it was a you know good way to relieve the stress and then and make a little bit of money on the side. You know, it was fun. And you were doing better than most. You saw that you had a knack for it. Yeah, that started back in the army. I was, you know, we we played for that was a monthly payday stakes, and you know we were privates making a uh, hundred and ten dollars a month, but we would play for quarters and fifty cents, and uh, we keep track. And at the end of the pay cycle, everybody would pay up. So I always did well, but still, it was a home game mentality. It wasn't uh, anything like what you see today. Even back when I came to Vegas in 1982, they were uh, much more professional than I ever had, could imagine. Uh, you know, I didn't know any of the ins and outs. I was just 
kind of dropped off there, and here I am. I say, okay, I'm Mr. Home Guy from Mentality, uh, mentality uh, from Miami, and I'm just going to, you know, win like I, d I did, and I found out that wasn't the case. Yeah. We had to start out with Limit Hold'em, and my only experience with Limit Hold'em was playing at high-low split, so that really didn't qualify me much, you know. We had uh, eight games in our, uh, I'm sorry, we had home games. We'd have eight or nine guys, and at least eight would take the flop in a high-low <laughs> game. I mean, we thought queen three of clubs was a starting hand in Omaha, I'm in uh, Limit Hold'em made her better. Uh, we never played high until maybe about a year or two after we started that. So a friend of mine went to Vegas. His name is Gary Lashbrook, and he bought that practice game called Texas Hold'em. And, you know, we played it high-low, then we started playing it high. And I remember one night I lost my ass. I said, get the hell out of my house. I never want to see you. I don't ever want to play this game again. <laughs> I think I lost like $400, and I was like a paycheck almost back then. But uh, two weeks later, I was back playing it again, you know. Yeah. And then you come out to Vegas, and it takes a little bit to get your feet wet. It takes a lot, you know. We didn't have much publications back then. They had um, hardly any books to read. Uh, there was a magazine. It was actually, I think it was Card Player. It was called something different. Card Player started in 1988. Okay, then they bought it from June Fields, and it was called something else, and I just can't remember the name of it. But there's the same magazine, and they just took it over. I don't know if they... God, I wish I could remember the name of it. No, the Fields started in 1988. They did? Yes. Okay. Well, I thought it was earlier than that. And the Shulmans bought it in 2000, I want to say. From and obviously Linda Johnson, Linda Johnson yeah. owned it throughout the 90s. Okay. So there was some some publication that you could read, but there wasn't much information, yeah. you know, and it was, uh, uh, I, I, when did Super System come out? That was... Oh, I'm not connected to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, that was very helpful. Uh, but back when I started, they were... 72. Really, Let's just throw a yeah, year out there. There wasn't much in, information. Probably it was wrong. sparse, you know? Yeah. So uh, I learned from the School of Hard Knocks, so I would... You know, I started playing 3-6 Hold'em. I went up to 10-20. I stayed there for a couple of years. Uh, finally busted out. You know, took my retirement from the FAA out there. Lost that. But I, I was actually making more at poker as a beginner than I was as an air traffic controller, if you can believe that. Well, we alluded to that you were 38 years old yeah, um, when right. this happened. I mean, that's... Yeah. I'm 37. I mean, I'm, I would be terrified to start a new career at this point in my life. Yeah, um, I thought I knew what I was doing, you know, but like I said, you know, I come out there uh, to play with the Sharks and I was just a guppy and I, I didn't know that, you know, nobody, nobody explained things to me. But through the school of hard knocks and a lot of experience, uh, I, I learned the game and I, when I came back from uh, my um, departure, which was 1986, I believe, I was a dispatcher for the Daytona Beach Police Department. I was in training to be one. And I got an offer to deal with the Las Vegas Hilton. I said, I got to go. So I took the game much more seriously at yeah. that point, And I, I started reading materials. And, and along with my experience, I just got better and better at it. You know, it's always, you're always a work in progress. I don't care who you are. You're always going to learn something sooner or later. Whether you're Phil Helmuth or Daniel Negrano, you're going to pick up something every day. Who were the guys back then? that you were chasing, trying to get to? They were like, who were the top players yeah, back then? Yeah, when you first showed up to Vegas. Yeah. I guess, um, you know, you'd have to always say Doyle Brunson was, uh, a, you know, top-notch. Dewey Younger, of course, was, was big then. Uh, Don Zuin, another great player, was there. Um, let's see who else. My memory... 1978, by the way, Super System, 1978. Oh, 78, so there was a little bit of, of help there, but I didn't read that until I won my first tournament, which was a major tournament, which was 1987, I believe. That's also, didn't Doyle charge like $1,000 for the book or something? Like, you only had a few copies out there? I had no idea. <laughs> Before know. it got mass-produced again? Yes. Um, so, okay, your first tournament cash comes... I want to say 1987. Major tournament. Major tournament, yeah. I, so, I uh, played at the Stardust. series, not dailies and stuff. Right. Like I played at the Stardust for years, and we had uh, a promotion where we played two tournaments a day, 
six days a week for nine months yeah. to try and win a thousand, just a thousand dollar entry fee into the main event, which was called the Stairway to the Stars. And I picked up a great amount of experience from, from that period of time. You were a prop player too, right? Uh, before that, I propped at the uh, Power Station, I think. Yeah, yeah, I did that. Oh, but I'm sorry. Yes, after the uh, I got hired on the Hilton, I hit that tournament, and I didn't want to really deal anymore. Mm -hmm. So I became a prop player. I played at the Hilton for a while. Yeah. So, uh, and it's funny because they forced me to play seven card stud eight or better, and I, I didn't really know the game that well, and I didn't like it that much, so I quit. And that's my first, wait, well, was my first, yeah, my first bracelet was that it better. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. What was, the, what was the prop deal back then? Well, how did, what was the terms? You basically, they just put you to play any game they stuck you in? Yeah, the, like the props nowadays have a little bit more leniency. Uh, you're not there, I mean, like I also propped for a while at the Commerce Casino. And um, those players, you were never told you got to go here, you got to go there. They didn't say pick up and leave. Now at the Hilton, it was different. The game, the game got good or filled up, you had to leave. When the game yeah. got bad and got short, you had to go in. It was, and then, would you go start this game? Would you go start that game, you know? Uh, so it was a lot different experience. But I got to play um, some of the games that I liked, and uh, I was getting paid for it. So it, it worked out pretty well. And then when I went to the Commerce and Prop, that was almost for two years, and that was to introduce Omaha Ada better into the yeah. casino. And we played uh, one in 200 uh, or 75, 150 for like almost two years straight. It was a great gig for me. They gave you like some big amount, like $250 a day to, to play. And they covered my expenses. And it was, it was a really, you know, profitable experience for me. I enjoyed it. That became and your game, right? Omaha Ada Better? That was my game, yes. Very much so. I, I transferred over to Omaha, away from Hold'em. As a matter of fact, they wanted me to start playing more limit Hold'em and less Omaha Ada Better as a prop, and I, and I said I quit. <laughs> I, I mean, for, you can't pay me enough to play limit Hold'em every day. A lot of people would say that nowadays. <laughs> when did uh, you get the tournament bug? That was my early Stardust days. I was introduced into their dailies. They were $55, $55 buy-ins or $110 buy-ins. And I played them quite a bit. And uh, they would have weekly tournaments, maybe a $150 buy-in, and I won a couple of no limits. And it was just fun, and I enjoyed the competition. And uh, I'm a competitive type guy, you know, sports. And, you know, I played softball, baseball, you know. And uh, not basketball too short, but you know I played a lot of sports, and that was it just makes you competitive, you know. And to be competitive in your adult years, there's really nothing like poker. You know, you can still do it. Um, you don't have to worry about the physicality part of it. You know, you just need the mental part of it. And uh, so it's it's great for people in their 30s through their 60s, you know, to participate yeah. in something like poker. Did you? Uh have a mind to prefer tournaments over cash games because i remember the, there's the story goes that back in the day before the boom tournaments were kind of dying out people you know you're just using it as an excuse to get together for cash games really mm -hmm. outside of the series and maybe the super bowl of poker mm -hmm. um the tournament experience has probably shifted you know for the better for the worse and the it's formative years. I'm not talking about when the Binions had it, but you know, with Puggy and Doyle, I'm talking about when we'd go to the Bicycle Club and uh, that casino would host tournaments. And then they started to give away Corvettes and the interest grew and they were, you know, best all around players. And wow, you know, you could be, make money and be recognized by your peers and win a Corvette, which yeah. by the way, I didn't win one. I came in second to one. <laughs> But uh, there were other prizes, TVs, cash, and it was just amazing. The, the Bicycle Club had a really big impact on, on tournaments back in those days. And, but to put up $1,000 for a tournament, there maybe was about 35 to 50 of us that would do that religiously. So there were some pioneer days there for us too, no matter where we went, whether it be Bicycle, Commerce, um, what was the, I guess, Binions, uh, what was the place we played? Mirage. 
spot in Reno, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so you had to, keep, you know, there were some lean years where you had to keep it. The interest we we kept alive. it going, right, yeah. right. Like Dario and his crew started it, and then people like myself. I'm gonna see if I can remember some names from back then. Tom McAvoy, um, Tuna Lun, uh, really kept it going. Phil Helm was, was there. Daniel and those came a lot later in, yeah. the, in the 90s. But uh, we kept it going. You know, we were the uh, front runners. And then once the moneymaker effect came in, you know, well, we couldn't. <laughs> You can keep people away from putting up a thousand dollars. Now a thousand is almost nothing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's before we get into you know your cash record, let's talk about the bracelets. <laughs> I mean, you have a you have a ton of titles, but your three World Series of Poker bracelets. Uh, what did it mean to you at the time to win them, um, and versus what it means now? Now that you know they're held in higher regard, or, you know. Well, my my personal reason and then a lot of people who's, who really glorified the bracelet I think are full of it but my <laughs> personal reason is a lot of freaking money I mean you know where can you turn a what do they call that a toothpick into a lumber yard like a big poker tournament you know so here you're putting up a thousand dollars and you're going home with 150,000 on the same day you know I so, said wow this is awesome so it's strictly the money yeah now the camaraderie of the bracelet and being recognized amongst your peers is an honor. It's almost like the baseball hall of fame, you know, you're you know, you're you're elevated, you're you're recognized, you know. So there's some of that too. And um, and in enjoying the competition, you know, always kept me going. But the primary reason it was money and I think if anybody tells you differently they're lying, but you know, maybe that's just me. Well, your guys won a ton of tournaments. You know, I mean, I've gone home with a lot—not just bracelets, but you know, rings and other trophies and plaques. And uh, didn't you win two watches in the same day? I did. As a matter of fact, it was the. Uh, well, you have done your homework. It was at the Taj Mahal, and I was uh, day two of a no limit. There was like uh, I think maybe I don't know four tables coming back, so thirty-six players. So I had to play that, and they were starting the stud tournament, and I was really big on keeping our games alive. You know, the, the numbers were going down, no limits going up, and I love limit games, let's face it. I'm a limit player, basically. So I entered it just for the numbers, to keep the numbers up, you know, to keep the game going. And I played it on my 10-minute break and on my dinner. By the end of dinner, <laughs> I had five times the chip, five to one chip lead on the whole field. I don't even know how I, I, if I tried that again, I couldn't do it. I don't even know how it happened, but I do know I never missed a raise. <laughs> and a lot of it was just, you know, making pots bigger than they should have been. But I was doing it with hands or draws and always winning, you know, it was yeah. just, it was phenomenal. So uh, they moved that final table next to the, no limit table so I, so there's like five of us left at the no limit and there's six of us in the stud and I could go back and maybe play on you know I'm a break in the no limit just play a little bit and get back but I was watching my chips go down and down and down and I was I think when I finally got to the final table and I was done with the no limit I was fifth in chips and uh, still managed to come back and uh, win my uh, second tournament in the same day I forget the year but I think it was 2007, sometime in November. Uh, yeah, this was after the boom, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Poker, poker was alive and well. So, uh, and, um, yeah, I, it was uh, quite the experience. And uh, met some good people, the kid at the No Limit. We made a deal, heads up, and I got that title, you know. And I said, you know what, you can keep the watch. And then after I won the other one, I said, would you mind giving me back the watch? <laughs> because <laughs> good of a story, I got a story fun. here, you know, and I'll even pay you for it. He said, sure, don't worry about it, John, no problem. So it was, it was fun. You keep all these trophies somewhere? You have like a display no, case or anything? No, they're scattered everywhere. I've probably given half of them away, yeah. you know. I think the most prestigious trophies as far as uh, looks go or the Remingtons from the LAPC. Yeah, you got and, a lot of those. That's, yeah. that's the coolest looking trophy. Isn't it? The yeah. cowboy on the horse. Yeah. I mean, 
I mean, you even see that awesome. at the White House in the background, you know, the yeah. presidents have that, you know. So I probably have maybe four or five of them left, but I think I won about nine or ten of them. Yeah. <laughs> you got cowboys everywhere. Yes, I do. Um, I even have James Woods in my uh, in my living room because uh, when uh, I coached him and he won it, he said, would you mind taking this, keeping this until I, because uh, he was going to go back to Vegas, and that was about three years ago, and I still have the trophy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for him to come pick it up. Come pick it up, James. Yeah, yeah. He, he, might, he might not remember he won that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he remembers, trust me. It was a big day for him. Uh, let's talk about the cash record. And put into context for the people who uh, don't know at home, you hold the record, the ongoing record, <laughs> mm -hmm. for most caches in recorded you know, live tournaments of all time. 540 as is the official count right now. Okay. You know, tournaments get lost here and there. Yeah. But you have a... I know, cashed second the other night, so it's 541, but the mob doesn't know yeah, that yeah, yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they don't know. They don't know it yet. Second place is Men Win with 498. So he's not even to 500 yet. And he's slowed down a lot in recent years. Uh, Randy Holland, who you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. number three, 469. Then a huge gap before TJ right. is at 400. Yeah. So, I mean, you got 140 cash lead on TJ, you know, That's who's great. been around. He has. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Highmiller in fifth, David Levy in sixth, Roland Israel Ashvili. Mm -hmm. Roland Israel, who's still going strong at the series every year. I, still I played with him at the win the other day. Yeah, but he's got he's behind by 150 caches to you. Yeah, 150 caches. Then you got Alan Kessler. We don't need to give him any more attention. <laughs> Kathy Liebert. Kathy Liebert. Congrats, number nine. Alan Meyerson. And then I think your biggest threat to the record. I'm going to say before you say. Yeah. I didn't know who you're going to say, but I'm going to tell you who my biggest threat is. Okay. Ari Engel. That's right. All right. Number so 11, <laughs> Mr. Ari Engel himself who, you know, is still a young man, but somehow is uh, in every single tournament series on earth simultaneously. <laughs> yeah, he's always there. He's, uh, he's still got a while to go, though. He's at 360. So you still got 180 caches on him. Yeah, but Ari plays a super, super amount of tournaments, and he's so skilled and so smart that uh, he's my pick to yeah. pass me, and I hope he does just... Not while I'm alive. <laughs> yeah, he's got to he's got to keep going for a while to do it. So. He does. Oh, he will. He will. Unless I'm pulling for him to become a multimillionaire, he'll just give up poker. Wouldn't that be nice, right? <laughs> just let you have the record, and then he can he, he might he can sail off. He's into such the a sunset. nice kid. He'll probably be, get right within one of me and quit. <laughs> that would be the respectable thing for him to do, right? <laughs> no, I don't know if that's respectful. He's he, but he's so he's such a sweetheart. Yeah, I'm looking at the at the rest of this list. You know, got Phil Helmuth in fourth. Eric Baldwin, okay, he's he's still cashing, but you know he's still in LA. He's got family. Can't go Phil is fourth in what? Fourteenth. Uh, uh, oh, fourteenth in uh, in the rankings. Oh, Daniel, okay. Daniel's twenty first, uh -huh. three twenty two. Mister Seidel, twenty third. Um, yeah, it, I think it's Ari that the one. If anybody's gonna catch it, but it's gonna be a long time. Well, the thing you were is, the leader for a long time. In this what country. their what their problem is is I'm 78 years old, and I think that's not their problem. It is their problem because I'm still going strong. That's what I'm saying. I think I think I'm going into you know, I might wear a bracelet when I'm 84. Who knows? Yeah. But I think I, I think I got another five or six good years left, and I've been like knocking them down, you know, 20, 25, 30 a year for, and uh, part of the reason is uh, when the poker boom started, not so much the boom, but when players were starting to brand themselves and go to Hollywood and things like that I was just kind of left behind you know I just didn't I wasn't quite in the loop and I just you know I was married I had a family I really didn't care that much so I was starting to show up to tournaments like at the, I remember this at Foxwoods and then at the Taj Mahal I do all the East Coast ones you know I say where the hell is everybody actually like I see Tony Ma and maybe one other guy I knew and I didn't know anybody else I said, what's going on? So it was what we called back in those days, it was labeled in Card Player Magazine as the Tournament Trail. So I just stayed on the Tournament Trail. I didn't vary one bit. I didn't go to all the Hollywood charity events or anything like that. I think yeah. I went to one. Um, so I just kept on it. And 
the grinding. That's what the grinding, and, and a lot of those guys, and uh, I have to give them credit, were doing other things, and uh, I was still down there in the trenches, you know. And I think that's why I got to where I am in the number of caches, and and the other ones kind of tapered off. Now, Men the Master is a little bit different because he, I think he's been in Nam for a couple of years, and he hasn't been playing much. He comes out to the series, and then we don't see him anymore. So yeah. But uh, yeah, he has slowed down quite a bit. Yeah, he was over 100 ahead of me at one time. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, you're right. There was a time period when all the top players were doing, you know, made for TV stuff, or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, invite only cash games or whatever. And right, right. You did a you get a full tilt deal for a while. I mean, I feel like people always knew you as the the guy on the tournament show you don't want to run into, right? <laughs> I don't know about that, but yeah, I had uh, I had oh. I had a deal with Poker Stars when they first started. Uh, it wasn't a long deal, you know, it was just like maybe a couple months. Uh, what was the very first Paradise Poker? Paradise. I even had, me and Randy Howard went down to Costa Rica and we were recruited to, you know, play for them. So we, you know, we, we wore their insignia no matter where we went. Uh, that might I think have been the one biggest, of the very first online poker sponsorships. I think it was. Yeah. Uh, and I think my first uh, win with their insignia was in Austria. Uh, I was wearing uh, their gear, and I won a heads up uh, no limit tournament, which I had really almost no experience in, but things just kind of went my way, kind of like that stud tournament I was telling you about. <laughs> but I remember my first match, it was against Jeff Le Jeffrey Lissandro, and uh, we took 5% of each other, you know, to, just for luck. and. Uh, I had a pair of aces and he had a pair of threes and he flopped the three. So I had, uh, you know, I checked up, I let him bet, you know, so he did bet. So I called and then on the turn I put all the money in with aces. I thought, I'm good, he's got ace queen, got, can't have anything big here. He turns over a set of threes. I said, oh, this is going to be a short trip. It was my <laughs> first match out of seven and the ace hit the river. So that's the only reason why I won the heads up. Tournament. There you go. Yeah. There you go. But uh, well, you've been all over the world at this point. Is there any place you haven't been? Uh, haven't been to the uh, Macau. Macau. Yeah, I haven't been there yet, and that's where all the the big names are right now. You know. Yeah. So, but I haven't been there. What was your your favorite tournament destination on the trail? Um, always uh, the. Uh, well, on the trail, it was always uh, Brigada or Commerce or, of course, the World Series. But worldwide, it was always London, uh, Nice. I played there for a while, some in Paris, and even went to Kiev. I oh, played, really? I played a, uh, I forget what they call it, a Pacific tournament, not Pacific, uh, European, EPT, that's what it was. Barcelona, I, I got to travel all over the, the world with this, you know, it was great. Uh, what would you say is your proudest poker achievement? Can you pick one? I'd always have to go to the, to the No Limit bracelet. That was the second bracelet that I won. And uh, it's just, uh, it was my biggest cash, it was about 250,000 and uh, outlasting a field of really, really tough players back then. I remember Helmuth, he wasn't on any of my tables, but he came to watch it. I guess he made a habit of watching all the No Limit final tables. He did, yeah. you know. Maybe there was a broadcast he could sneak on as well. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, there was no broadcast back in those days. This well, that's right. You could hear him uh, jump on the, in the broadcast booth for a lot of the big main event final tables that's uh, true back in the day right. as well but this he was just an observer yeah, so he, maybe he loved he, tournaments from way back yeah maybe he kept notes on all the players I don't know but uh, yeah he was there and just you know winning something like that as prestigious as that is was probably my greatest thrill in, in poker and uh, as far as other accomplishments goes you know the number of caches is really cool winning two tournaments and side by side final tables you know that's that's pretty cool I like that and then another one, which would be at the Bicycle Club, where I wore, you know, they have a venue that lasts about 30 days, and to win three was, there's very few players that have won three. I mean, like, you can count them on your hand, and I got to win four. So <laughs> nobody's done that, so I got to be proud of that, you know.
Yeah, that's that's a that's a hot streak right there. Yes, and I had a lot of competition. I mean, Alan Cunningham, I believe, won three that year. Lane Flack won two, and uh, it was some big names were playing back then. You know, I want to talk about your new book. It's called uh, "Make Better Poker Tournament Deals." I have to feel like nobody's been in more, you know, deal making situations lifetime than you have been. Well, uh, at first. I never made a deal, and it's not that I was, uh, you know, arrogant or thought I was the best player in the, in the room, but it was just that nobody ever told me about making deals, you know, and it was never really approached. So we, uh, you know, uh, before I started writing this book, I, I was looking up my caches, or I'm sorry, when I was starting to write the book with Alan uh, Shoemaker. That's right, card player columnist Alan Shoemaker, and also uh, Jan Siroki. Yes, yes. So... Um, Lost my train of thought there. Where was I going? About you, when you were looking up your pages. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. So I, I was trying to look for stories to tell. So I said, well, let me go to see my caches, you know. And boy, with the first 20 years or so, I didn't make any deals. They're all big caches, you know, like 60,000, 70,000, 50,000, you know. And, um, but now the limit tournaments are much lower, you know. So uh, as I've gotten older, I've gotten into more deal-making experiences and uh, it's been a, a you know a, a task that is uh, let's see an education in progress you know so you know at first I was always Mr. Nice Guy I don't want to step on anybody's toes and then and I would never take advantage of anybody but you have to realize that you know certain players are just not geared to win a tournament unless they get very very lucky so you know your skills are worth more than putting in the numbers in an ICM, uh, you know, calculation formula. You know? So it's good to recognize that, and the book brings a lot of that uh, out, you know. Were there any crazy uh, situations you found yourself in where you maybe made a, made a good deal in, in your favor? Uh, nothing in particular, but uh, if I can tell you the, the history of the book, how it came Perfect. about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was very... <clears throat> Uh, literature was very sparse uh, when it came to making deals at uh, final tables. Now, Jan Siroki is a poker coach and a friend of mine who helps me out with my metagame, very, very much so. And he introduced me to Dr. Shoemaker. So with my experience and number of caches and Dr. Shoemaker's academic credentials on negotiations and his years and years of doing business, uh, Jan thought we'd be a perfect match to write such a book. So we got together, we used to, a lot of it was during the pandemic, and we'd meet in a park and we'd sit there and he'd record me and back and forth. I got to know Alan fairly well and, you know, we started a friendship. But what's good about the book, what, what our readers should expect would be uh, c having a complete dossier on negotiating theory. Let me have a drink. <clears throat> deal-making principles and personal examples from my own experience. The book is filled with information that will improve most players' net in poker, which demands an ever-increasing edge to becoming a profitable player. And like every good book, this book demands ownership, reading, and study. Well, there you have it, guys. If you're listening now and you want to know how to get the better of that final table, check out Make Better Poker Tournament Deals. It's available now on Barnes & Noble, Amazon, wherever you can get books. It's a paperback. There's a Kindle version. You have no excuse. Go do it right now. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, the book can pay for itself because if you, if you learn how to make book, uh, better poker deals, you will immediately and forever increase your profits and your bankroll. Right. Right. Exactly. You make one good deal, you made the money back on the book and then some. And then some. Exactly. We have some uh, rapid fire questions to close things out. If you're ready to go, I'm, I'm not good with rapid no, feel, answers. Feel free to answer as slowly as you want. Okay. <laughs> it's, I really shouldn't call it rapid fire. This happens every time. As long as I don't have to give a rapid answer. There you go. Um, what was the best shot you ever took? What were do you mean a, by a shot? Were you uh, were you risky with the bankroll? Did you ever put too much on the line and it work out in your favor, or were you very you know disciplined and strict moving up? Hmm. I never really took. I'm not a shot taker. However, in my beginning years, I would pretty much 
you know, be out there gambling, putting it all on the line, you know. And as you get older and you go through up and down in your bank rows, you kind of, you know, realize that sometimes discretion is a little bit better and money management is more important because when you're younger, you can always get more bank rows, more backers, whatever, you know. But as you get older, you know, you need to be a little bit more careful and manage your money and make investments. Uh, what was the biggest pot you ever won or lost? Your choice. Um, I would say probably in the twenty, thirty thousand dollar bracket. And I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, a three and six thousand dollar player, but in my heyday, I was playing as high as uh, five hundred, a thousand. My stable game was three and six hundred. Um, my biggest loss was about thirty three, thirty four thousand. It was about a twenty six hour period. It was kind of a strange game because um, it was one game and one game only. And we did it because this one guy wanted to play. He was a prince from Arabia. He brought his own suitcase. And it was seven cards, stud, high, low, split, no qualifier. Yeah. So in this game, the premise is you don't want to really play big pairs. You play small cards because you're always on a free roll of anybody that's playing pairs. Well, this man not only played big pairs, but he would cap every street because he had jacks and he didn't care about somebody with a deuce or a four right. or a seven or an ace or, he right. didn't care and you know sometimes you'd get sandwiched or you would help him sandwich someone else you know and so I think yeah, Mike Madison was in the game and he was sitting on my left and then the guy left the game and Mike and I were both stuck somewhere like $20,000 a piece and we didn't know how we were going to get it back it was really it was really like rubbing salt in the wound because he went to a game right next to us no. and played like twice as high and all the bigger players were just loving it and we just sat there and, oh god so we struggled and uh you know i played for another four or five hours uh, and i was tired and i left and you know, I put my tail between my legs and went home but that was my biggest loss ever i mean playing with a prince though that's that's uh some somebody rub elbows with <laughs> who else have, who else have you uh, played with over the years that well, was memorable i'd have to Got to give kudos to my friend James Woods. You know, very, very. Uh, James plays every series. Yes, and he's better and better, and he, he always gives me credit for his good play. Uh, I think James has some natural skills and reading ability on his own, but in the the limit environment, I really helped him out a lot on his games. Uh, case in point, he cashed more times than I did at the two two LAPCs ago, and then the next year about the same as me. He had almost 20 caches in, in two years. That's phenomenal. Not, yeah. not too many people do that. Um, who else I played with? I, haven't, I didn't play with Donald Trump, but he did come down to congratulate me one time. So I, When you won at the Taj? Yeah, I went at the Taj. He came over with his entourage, you know, and he shook hands, and, and it was uh, cordial. Uh, who else? Uh, nobody coming to mind other than just great poker players, you know. Um, what couple, about... A couple, uh, a couple guys that, you know, own TV stations in France, you know, they, <laughs> they played my games. And one time I remember I got disgusted and I was in a shorthanded game with uh, Jack Clower and this guy who owned a TV station and I just threw the, threw the cards and they accidentally hit a chip and they went flying into the air and landed on the floor. And the guy reached down and picked it up and put it on the card and so on the back of the table. So Jack Harris says, how does it feel to have a billionaire pick up your cards, John? <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, you really meet a lot of nice people in poker circles. And as the years have gone by, the people have gotten better. I mean, quality, quality people. Not to say that the old timers weren't quality people, but there were some sketchy people in those days, let's face it. <laughs> well, there's still sketchy people, but I think there's a lot more good people to drown them out. That's true. Um, what about uh, the largest non poker wager? Uh, don't really do it. You know, yeah. maybe, uh, geez, $500 on a, on a future bet, but that's it. I'm, Disciplined. I'm just, just not interested, you yeah. know, just not interested. I, I, I've seen poker players that have, good poker players that have leaks and are on the rail all the time, you know, over the past 10, 15 years, I'm not going to mention any names, but certainly uh, I didn't want to become one of those, so I've never really 
leak that much. Lately, I kind of slid a little bit with video poker, but, you know, I kind of like pulling in the reins again, you know. So I'm not one of those, uh, I'm not big on uh, proposition bets and things like that. Like, yeah. I would, you know, uh, I, I had weight loss surgery and I thought maybe I should make a prop bet on <laughs> with <laughs> someone like Mattisau, you know. Yeah. But I couldn't do that to my friends, so I didn't do that. Yeah, that would have been the way to get a, a yeah. surefire win. Like 85 pounds. <laughs> Uh, what about the best swap or piece you've ever had of anybody? Hmm. Let me think about that one. Best swap. Who did pay me some money? It was pretty good. I mean, theoretically, you shouldn't be swapping with anybody. <laughs> no, I, I, I do swap sometimes. Uh, I just, man, I can't come up with it. I'm sorry. But there has been a, a couple of good, or maybe it's more like I've put somebody in and got a good, you know, good piece back. But... Uh, Nothing comes to mind. Sorry. If you could name the entertainment for the Super Bowl halftime show, who would you choose? Are you talking about entertainment or poker? Or no, I'm asking you. Oh, everything. just a, this is a question. We don't need to talk about poker all the time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm saying Miami John has the has the controls. Mm -hmm. Who's he putting on the field? Well. I guess I'd have to go back to my old days, and they're, most of them are gone. But, you know, seeing Elvis Presley again would be pretty cool. Okay. And Jerry Lee Lewis, all those old rockers. Um, and then maybe uh, some Aerosmith after that. You know, some, some of the old stuff I, I really We can like do them. Aerosmith with some holograms. There you go. There we go. And we can, <laughs> with the, the finale could be the Beatles, I mean, you know. There you go. I mean, that would be great. My daughter's actually uh, learning some Beatles songs right now on bass. She's uh, got day tripper down pat. <laughs> right. <laughs> Did you have a celebrity doppelganger growing up? Did people tell you you look like anybody? They said I look like Don Nottingham, which was a football player for the Miami Dolphins. He was a fullback. Don Nottingham. Yeah. I think I had an old card from back in the day. <laughs> Probably. Right next to my U. Yvonne yeah. Sherman. And, uh, yeah. They didn't get me confused with Larry Zonka. But <laughs> it was definitely Nottingham. I used to work for... Uh, a finance company and my first assignment was to go repossess a Jaguar. I said, oh, that was a nice car. I see what it is. It says, belong to Larry Zonka. <laughs> so <laughs> he had just uh, was, uh, came out of the University of Syracuse and he was a rookie down at the Miami Dolphin camp. And before I could go to his house and steal his car, uh, he paid it off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, in my childhood bedroom, I had a photo of Larry Zonka autographed because we used to live right next to... Um, in my teen years, right next to the Dolphins training camp in Davie. Oh, yeah. After I moved from Hialeah. Uh -huh. And um, uh, we saw him at an event or something, and he signed it. And uh, it's a photo of him, like, carrying four guys on his back. You know, four guys, four Pittsburgh Steelers, I believe it was. Um, yeah, so do you collect anything besides mm, cash? Trophies. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not a collector of anything at all. No. Try not to tell bad beat stories anymore. I used to do that, but, you know. But, uh, no, I don't really collect anything. Uh, what are you interested in that most people aren't? Any off-the-wall hobbies? Marlene, do I have any off-the-wall hobbies? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, what about superstition? You know what? I have, a, okay, yeah. I, I have a special needs daughter, and I take care of her. She's my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm into uh, Special Olympics swimming, Special Olympics bowling. I've traveled with her up to Reno and watched her win medals. That's awesome. And I can't tell you how gratifying the experience is to watch these Special Olympic athletes. And I'll give you w one example. There was uh, a meet, and my daughter was not in the meet. And uh, all these kids are winners. They, they never lose, and they always root for each other. Yeah. It's not like... You know, yeah, Mark Spitz and <laughs> those kind where they're just out to win the medals and the glory. You know, these kids are just you know, there's no competition. They love each other. So there's this one meet going by, and this girl is falling behind and behind and behind, and she's very very slow. And now, I think it was a 50 meters, 25 each way. So that they are finished the race. And this girl still has to touch the wall, go touch the wall, and go back and finish. That's how slow she was. And she never quit. Yeah. And, she, and we all watched her. 
and we watched her and we watched her. And uh, just gives me goose, goosebumps to tell the story. But when she got to the wall, um, oh, when she got to the wall and touched, she jumped up and screamed in victory that she made it. And the whole auditorium just burst into applause. Yeah. And just this smiles and laughter. And I just can't describe how wonderful that is. Yeah. So that's what I've done. And I did have one hobby. I used to play accordion professionally. I forgot about that one. You were handed a note over here. Somehow. Yes, my friend Marlene brought me this note. We played accordion professionally. Accordion professional I was, accordion player. How do you leave that out? I don't know. That's such an off the wall hobby. How do you not say that? I gave it up when I was eighteen. As far as playing professionally, I, I played in a German American band, and I had to wear these suspenders and short <laughs> pants. The Lederhosen, right? Yes, that's exactly what they were. And it was kind of embarrassing. I'm 18 or 19, you know. I said, uh, I don't think I want to do this like anymore. Polka you know? music, or huh? Polka? Yes. Oh yeah. But see, back then the twist was popular, and I was the only guy in the band that knew something jittery to play. And I would play a kind of a boogie-woogie song on my accordion, and they would join in. And But I was the lead in this thing, and everybody was out there doing the twist. You know, they they just loved it, you know. So, so you're playing, like, local sock hops and stuff? Like, what kind of gigs are we talking? Um, my last gig um, I did was um, was on a cruise ship. There was their regular piano player got sick, and they needed me to to fill in so i said oh good so I, I i got on a cruise ship and went to the bahamas and stayed there for two days and came back it was great great experience Wait, so just real quick if you can play the accordion you can play the piano i didn't know that <laughs> well unfortunately i can only play with one hand <laughs> <laughs> okay but i do but i do play the left hand so if it's a c chord or c minus i just break the chord up you know yeah. but i can't do you know Mr. Nimble fingers on both hands, you know. So uh, okay, I was about yeah. to say because that's like that's two different skills, right? You're taking a exactly. completely different job. Yeah. So I still play the piano, and uh, just recently, Marlene has a piano right here, and uh, I uh, I tried it, and I realized I don't read music like I used to. Uh, thank God it, I play enough poker every day to where I haven't lost it in poker, and now I I I can't tell a C from a B. On, on on the music, I said, man, I gotta start. I'm gonna, I'm think I'm gonna yeah. start taking a lesson again. Might create some more synapses in my brain. Something will fire, and who knows what else that'll exactly that'll bring up. <laughs> uh, but I think as, if you stay current in poker, you won't have that problem. Yeah, I don't. I know I've slowed down a little bit. My decision making gets a little fuzzy sometimes, but I just I go a little slower. Yeah, and, and uh, you know I try to come up with the right decision. Well, you said you don't like playing the marathon events anymore, right? I can't. I mean, I can't play the main event anymore. I can't go 10 days. And it's not the 10 days that don't kill me. It's the 40 days prior to the 10 days. That, that <laughs> right, I, right. That right. I, you know, I mean, it's all around town. You, you're not just at the series. You're right. at the area. You're at Binion's. You're doing here. You're doing that. And it's constant. And then you got to put 10 days with those kind of players against you. There's no way I can do it. About five years ago was my last main event. And I gave my chips away at 830 in the night. I mean, I literally knew I was beaten, still called, and uh, was just too tired to play. And that was day one. So so you find you're still sharp, it's just, you know, the endurance. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And uh, another thing that's helped my game is I've got into teaching poker and coaching poker. And as you teach and coach and you research yourself and you do things like that, you keep your mind active and you create new you know ideas in poker it keeps you fresh so that and my uh i don't know um taking care of my daughter uh has uh, energized me to you know becoming the player that i am today well you are 78 that's correct i'm assuming you're just gonna play until you're done right you know that's a scary proposition and i don't want to i'll use one name and I saw a man that played too long, and that was Johnny Moss. Johnny mm. Moss was obviously a great player, but he started to play uh, 75, 150, Omar Ada better with us, and the hands that he would show, I just had 
it just didn't make any sense. And uh, I think he stopped pretty much after that. But if I ever get to that point where I think three sixes and a jack are good in Omaha to better, that it's time for me to quit. Mm. And I hope I don't see that. I hope I have another good five to 10 years left. I hope so. You don't see too many 88 year old players playing. So I don't know if I can maintain that, but I sure would like to give it a shot. Well, any sport can do it. It's poker, right? That's for sure. <laughs> you don't see any basketball players walking around that late. No. Uh, are you superstitious at all? Um, yes, yes and no. Um, recently, uh, I've been to Feng Shui. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you can see I have nine lemons in a bowl that my father created the bowl and they're fresh lemons and they face south and i just put the lemons in there the other day and i came in fifth at the win <laughs> and second at the orleans for eight thousand in a no limit tournament grueling tournament 265 players and i told my friend marlene you see lemon power really really works hmm. oh yeah also, I went down and uh, I filled in as a substitution player uh, for my friend Marlene Stein, and uh, I, I got her a bunch of points. I came in first in the horse. <laughs> so, uh, lucky so, lemons. Yes, and uh, another, so wait, does the luck last as long as the lemons are fresh, or do you have to change the lemons? <laughs> uh, yeah, when they start getting a little rotty, you have to change them. Yeah, yeah, they have to be fresh, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, my friend Susan Gennard kind of got me into this lemon thing. We, you know, we've been playing together for a couple of years, and uh, you know, I've heard of Feng Shui before. I used to use it when I was married, you know, but I never knew about lemons until recently. So I don't want to say I'm superstitious, but I will be taking my lemons to L.A. <laughs> there you go. There you go. What about any phobias? Is there anything you're scared of? Mm -hmm. Mine is cockroaches, so don't feel like you need to be no. you know, yeah. brave in front of me. Yeah. No. Um, scorpions. <laughs> you know, we uh, had an invasion of scorpions about 10 years ago, and they were... Uh, Every now and then you'd see one in my house, right? So one day, my wife at the time saw a big scorpion running across the living room floor. She got a great big book and she stuck it behind it and she smashed it down to kill it. The only problem is it was a mother and there was about a hundred scorpions on her back and they all scattered. Oh my God, <laughs> nightmares. Yes. Nightmares. Yes. <laughs> so, I don't know what happened to those guys, but uh, I mean, we I hope saw you burned the house down. We saw two or three, and we wound up selling the house. <laughs> <laughs> you don't disclose that one, I hope. Yeah, yeah. No, we didn't have any scorpion problems after that. We got, you know, uh, Orkin out there. I guess they helped, but uh, yeah. So uh, I'm a little always afraid of stepping on one, of course, but nothing, nothing major. You mentioned that I think 28-hour session. What was your longest session? That was probably a that was 28, it. yeah. I can't possibly stay awake that, that much longer. Now, there was a, there's a player, he's still active, Yoshi Nakano. Yosh, yeah. Yeah, and he's a three, you know, we do a 72 hour player. And there was another guy who's deceased now, his name is Bill Gimple. And they were playing heads up at the Commerce when I was propping. So I come in to go to work, and they're heads up, two of them, so I'm not going to mess with that game, you know. So I'm watching this hand go down. They're playing two and four hundred poker. The pot's big. And Yost raises Bill. And the dealer, Bill calls. And there comes the flop. And Bill's sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> so the dealer wakes up Bill and says, it's your turn to bet. Now, Yost had actually told the dealer, wake him up, it's his turn. So Bill bets. They turn to Yost. And Yost is sleeping. <laughs> Now that's pretty extreme, but that that was probably the funniest thing I ever seen like that. Ugh. But uh, twenty eight hour, twenty four. Now uh, I'm about it, except for tournaments. Tournaments, I don't know why the adrenaline keeps you going, you know. But as far as cash games now, I'm a four to six hour kind of guy. I'm tired. I don't I don't want to go any further than that. Well, that's that's still great. I mean, yeah, 
you got 40 years on me, and that's how I feel. So. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, uh, I don't want to say hit and run, but I, I try to manage my wins. So if I start to slide back, I don't get into that thing where I'm going to be stuck so much that I need to stay and play. And I would only stay and play if the game justified it anyway. If it's a bad game, you know, if top-notch players are there, uh, that I know they're good players, what's the point? You know, the game's always going to be there the next day or the next day I'll come yeah. back rested. Do you have is, a nemesis? Sorry. No, that's okay. I was going to say, do you have a nemesis in poker? Somebody who always held over you or just seemed that way? No, not off the top of my head, but I'm sure there's quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> um, favorite gambling movie? Mm. That has to be um, the one with Johnny Chan in it. Rounders? Oh, Rounders. No, of course. That's a cool movie. I like that movie quite that's a bit. Usually, that's usually the top answer. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever had a near-death experience? No. Oh, that's good. Not, not we're, unless we're talking about bankrolls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, biggest pet peeve at the table? One of my pet peeves, which I was guilty of doing okay. myself, and uh, God rest his soul, uh, Kenny Skyhawk Flayton would call me out on it. He says, what are you doing, John? What are you doing, John? You're educating this guy. You took a beat. Oh. Keep your mouth shut. Or even to be nice about it, I said, you know, you really played that hand bad. You know, he says, you are making it harder for us pros to play. Don't tap the Do you boss. really, at the end of the day, <laughs> if you lose this guy in the game, do you really want to be heads up with me or, or this local or that local? And I said, no. You know, So that would be one of my peeves. Um, there are others, and that's not my main peeve. And I'm, if I can think about it a second... I'm not trying to pick on dealers, but when uh, a lot of inexperienced dealers in high-low split call a hand, and it's a high hand, and they say, but he has no low. That's a pet peeve. That's up to that player to read that. Mm. You know, you don't, if I have a low, you say it. But if I don't have a low, you know, you could say he's got two pair and an ace-eight for low. But if you say he's got two pair of no law, oh, I'm sorry, I have a seven eight, and there goes your pot. Right. It's up to that man to turn his hand over too and claim his part of the pot. So that's one of my peeps. Yeah, that happens also with other players too. Sometimes they'll they'll speak up when they're not supposed to. Right. Because it's on everyone to table their hands. Well, yes, they're not supposed to. But if it's uh, cards speak and the yeah, cards, if they're face up, of course, if they're face up, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever been like guilty of of doing that, but it, it certainly uh, you know is a no no. Uh, what is your bold prediction for poker's future? Well, I just see it growing, you know, and not at the rate it did during the boom, but um, you know, people still love to watch it. You know, you got to give credit to No Limit Poker that it's a, an exciting game to watch. And even though I'm a limit player, I will admit that, you know, watching seven card stud on te television, they tried it, you know, <laughs> or Omaha ate a better high-low split, is just too confusing for the masses, and it's really not that exciting, you know. And even with limit hold'em, it's just not fun to watch, but no limit is a whole different animal. So I think the poker is still going to grow, uh, you know. You still hear of young kids, so oh, I quit my job, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to play poker. Um, is maybe not be as profitable some t in some situations as it used to be, but it's still going to be pretty profitable most of the time. Okay. We end the podcast the same way every time with a question from the random question generator. Can you tell us about your childhood pets? The childhood pets, I had two. One was a boxer named Penny, and I was living in New Jersey, North Arlington, New Jersey, and I loved this dog so much. And he had a pink nose, very white with a pink dot on his nose. He was beautiful, and I loved him so much. 
And then one day I came home and my dad said, the dog had run away. I said, what? And I cried and I cried. I felt so bad. Fast forward, 40 years later, my uncle said, my dad was already deceased. By the way, John, your dad gave the dog away and put it on a farm. <laughs> I know. But at least it at least it lived its days on a farm. I mean, for real. They usually say that when the dog dies, it went to go live on a farm. But yours actually went to go live on, on an actual farm. Yeah. <laughs> but that didn't do me any good. I was no. I was You felt betrayed. So so <laughs> upset. And the second one was another horror story was that we had a little French poodle. And um, I was away at college, so I wasn't there. But my brother knocked on the door. My mother asked the door, and my brother had the poodle in his arms. And it was just devastated. It was uh, attacked by another dog. And my brother was crying. And... You know, the, the dog's name was Sherry. as a little white French poodle. And the family just loved this dog, you know. And it eventually died from its wounds. So those are my two gruesome <laughs> pet stories. But those were my two pets. Didn't have any, like, pet turtles or anything, pet snakes or anything like that, you know. <laughs> well, sorry to bring up the bummer of the memories. Uh, usually those stories don't end well anyway for anybody. Uh, but um, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing all these wonderful poker stories. You're quite welcome. I really enjoyed our conversation. That's it. That is the show. Thank you once again to John for the stories. Don't forget to check out John's new book, along with card player columnist Dr. Alan Shoemaker. It's called Make Better Poker Tournament Deals, and it's available right now wherever you get your books. You can follow John on Twitter, at MiamiJohnC, to see where he's currently at on the tournament trail. Uh, just last month, he found himself playing in a PLO cash game in Florida, winning a seven-way all-in pot. Uh, next, he'll head to Los Angeles and then to Houston. I mean, the guy is 78 years old, but he's not slowing down yet. Make sure you subscribe if you want to hear more from the Poker Stories podcast. Follow us on Twitter, at Card Player Media. And if you want to go the extra mile, please leave a nice five-star rating and review. Let us know you did so with an email to PokerStories at CardPlayer.com and we'll hook you up with a free digital subscription to CardPlayer Magazine. Thanks for listening.